thank you so much, Alexis, for taking the time to come on the show today. I really appreciate you, uh, you coming on and I'm excited about your company. Excited to talk with you today. Um, best place to get started, I think, for people who aren't familiar with, with you or your company, perhaps, would be to do just a very quick uh, you know, introduction to, to cover your company. Uh, and then we'll talk about your story a little bit and dig into cover a little bit more later. Sounds good. Sounds good, Jake. Thanks for having me on. So at Cover, what we do is we design, we permit, we manufacture, and we install homes. Uh, so we are building homes with production lines and software, uh, and we're modernizing the entire home building process from you know initial stages of zoning research and design and engineering all the way through to the nuts and bolts of how it comes together. Great. So um, can we talk about your your story a little bit, how you got to where you are now? I know Cover's been a few years in the making. Um, would love to kind of go back as as far as you're willing to go and talk about how you got interested in you know the housing space in general, came up with the idea for Cover and uh, went ahead and got started. Yeah. So, so, so from a very young age, I was always interested in construction and building and, and, uh, and, and so I decided to study architecture and uh, I also worked in architecture. And when I was working, I worked for different firms, mostly in residential. Uh, some of them were doing, you know, $120 million single family homes, super high end homes. Um, others were doing larger, you know, condo developments and uh, multifamily developments. Um, and then, you know, others were just doing, you know, more regular homes, right? Like the, you know, 300,000 to $1 million home. And what I saw was, you know, a, a, a construction process that was very uh, broken uh, and it was consistently broken, right? Projects were constantly over budget, uh, you know, missed deadlines, and it was just an unpredictable process. Uh, and so I started asking the question, well, why is this the case? Why is it so expensive? Why is it so unpredictable? And what I realized was that it was the coordination between all of the different parties involved to get a building done. So just as a specific example, uh, there was this one home we were working on and there was a little LED light on the top of a door frame uh, that would shine a light onto the door handle. Really nice touch, you know, high end detail, great. But they were charging $2,000 for that. And I thought to myself, you know, that, that's crazy, right? An LED is 50 cents. Maybe there's a $5 transformer max. You know, why is this $2,000? And what, what I realized was in order to get that implemented from an idea to, you know, it's installed and working in the home, you had to coordinate. So, sorry about that. Um, you, you have to coordinate with the architect, the general contractor, the electrician, the door fabricator, the door installer, uh, and the client. Right? And they all have to be on the same page on, on the sequence of events and how it's going to connect into this, the home's electrical system and how this is all going to work together. And, and so, you know, as soon as all those people are talking for a few minutes, you know, that, that's where your $2,000 comes from. So, so I, when I realized that the reason construction was so expensive was because people had to coordinate, I started asking the question, you know, why aren't homes made in a factory more like a product where it's a repeatable process, it's standardized, it's well understood. Uh, and as a result, it can be higher quality, lower cost, and much faster. Uh, that, that's, that's what the question, my, my head went. And I learned that that's when I learned that prefabrication was a thing, right? That's not a new idea. It's been tried for decades. And so I went and worked for a prefab company. And when I was working there, what I, what I learned was that yes, they were building homes inside of a factory, but all they had done was take the conventional construction process, right? Building with not drywall and two by four wood and hammers and nails and replicated that same conventional process inside of a factory. And, and so there were very minor efficiency gains by doing that. And, uh, and, and I, I was kind of shocked by this because you know, most products, when they're moved into a factory, you, they're redesigned from the ground up to be geared towards manufacturability, to be geared towards rapid assembly from the start. Uh, and that hadn't been done for homes. And nobody was doing that. And, and that's when I realized, you know, this is an incredible opportunity here. You know, if we make homes in a factory in a way that enables them to be fast, low cost, higher quality, uh, we can raise the bar for the quality of the spaces that we live in and make housing abundant for people. Uh, and that's when I realized, you know, 
let's do this. Uh, I started chatting with my co-founder, Jamwell. Jamwell and I went to architecture school together. And, uh, and, and he, you know, I, I, had come in, I had come into this problem more from the, from the perspective of you know, residential construction. What, is, you know, what, what are the problems in the field? And, and Jamwell actually studied architecture because he was interested in software and its use in architecture. So parametric design, generative design, uh, geospatial analysis. And so what we realized was that part of this was a manufacturing problem, right? The production line. And a huge part of this was an information problem, which was, you know, how do we take all of the information that goes into the design and the engineering and the material procurement uh, and, you know, all the way through to the, the installation itself, all of the details that go into a home and manage that process. Because uh, unlike most products, uh, you, you can't literally build the same home over and over again. There's just too much variation in properties, too much variation in, in environmental conditions like the direction of the sun, you know, that affects energy use, all of these things. And so a custom is necessary for construction. Um, and, and so we realized that, that managing the information to enable the construction to be, you know, basically mass custom, customization uh, was a key part of solving this problem. That's where the software comes in. Yeah, it's a great story and appreciate you sharing it. Uh, it's, it's interesting for me to hear, like I love hearing an entrepreneur who, comes to an idea, not like looking for an idea necessarily, or like a successful business necessarily. But, you know, you had a, a passion for architecture clearly, and saw problems throughout your journey, even, you know, went to, um, you know, these pre, uh, prefab home company, and got to like what you thought might be the solution and realized, well, this is pretty screwed up too. Uh, and we need to do that, you know, this still needs to be improved upon significantly and rethought kind of from scratch, how do we build homes in factories on assembly lines with lower skilled labor uh, for cheaper. And what I think was really interesting that I want to like, you know, reiterate is you mentioned, and I, I found this kind of in, in researching cover is that um, I think there's a very realistic promise of delivering something cheaper, faster, and of higher quality. And usually you kind of have to compromise at least one of those three dimensions, you know, speed, um, price and, and quality. And so I think it's a, it's an extremely, um, attractive proposition. I actually, I don't know. If, I mean, I like, I think it was independently, but for all I know, I saw your guys company in an article somewhere a few years ago and kind of took the idea without realizing it, but I've long been thinking that the idea of building kind of a Tesla for housing is extremely intriguing and, and borderline inevitable. Um, you guys view yourself as somewhat comparable to Tesla I understand in a couple of ways, but can we first just talk about how, um, you know, you might mirror them a little bit in terms of uh, building houses like a car company and, and maybe more specifically like Tesla using certain advanced automation and, and everything like that? Yeah, absolutely. It, so it, it, it really is about building homes more like how cars are made. Um, and, and the part of that that, 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 that applies is that it's a production line, it's a predictable process, and it's a process that ensures quality control, right? Um, you remove the complexity from what's you know, happening on site, you move it into the factory, uh, and you build machinery and process around that so that you know, we can bring anyone in, show them, how, you know, here's, here's what you need to do, watch them do it a few times, and now they're doing that task better than an expert tradesperson that's been doing it for 20 years because they have tools, they have process, and they have great documentation that supports that, right? And that's really, if you look at automotive, that's, that's how it's successful, right? It, it, it's about taking uh, what, what, what really is a very complex product. I mean, if you look at a car, there's hundreds of moving parts, there's curved surfaces, there's incredible finishes. It's, it's a very complex product um, and they're making it incredibly efficient in terms of the, the amount of labor that goes in, right? Uh, cars typically have like one to $2,000 worth of labor go into them in the factory. That's insanely low, right? Uh, you know, if, if you look at a, a, a construction site, you know, you're looking at somewhere between 30 to 50% of the cost is labor, just for reference. And so the big thing that we're doing is, is removing, you know, eliminating uh, the, the complexity from the, from what's happening on site, moving it into the factory like an automotive uh, process, 
and, and, and making it efficient like an automotive process, right? That, that's really where the analogy works. Uh, I think where the analogy breaks is, is that unlike cars, we have, uh, we are manufacturing panels in the factory. So wall panels, floor panels, roof panels, those com are come complete with insulation, structure, waterproofing, electrical plumbing, they ship to the site and then they're rapidly assembled, right? And so unlike a car where the finished product leaves the factory complete, um, we, we kind of ship out these Lego-like blocks uh, that are then assembled on site. So I think that that's kind of where the analogy uh, is slightly different. Yeah, I like the, uh, the Lego analogy. And uh, I saw that, you know, you, you guys, I think you wrote something like uh, finite parts, infinite designs in terms of the fact that you have, you know, these different panels, whether it's roofs or walls or whatever, um, but you can actually combine them in theoretically infinite designs for people's homes, whether it's one bedroom, two bedroom, uh, additional dwelling unit, I think it's called like the ADUs that people just kind of put in their backyards for, for work or whatever it might be. Um, so it's, I mean, it's an extremely compelling concept. I think, uh, I I'm at least super excited about it. I want one of, one of these for myself already. Um, I, I think about, you know, the fact that you are taking costs out of the labor in the factory, uh, you know, you're trading carpenters and plumbers for people who can, you know, kind of stand in an assembly line and plug in and, and do their task. And without compromising on precision because of the automation, which you mentioned, and like you can train these people for their very specific jobs. And then I understand you're also cutting costs out of the kind of shipping process because you're doing it in parts as opposed to like building a home and shipping it. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, one of the big challenges with most approaches to prefab that, you know, in the past have been that they, they ship these large, you know, really shipping container size rooms. Um, and, and then they require, you know, oversized trucks and special permits to take these on the road. Uh, and they also require large, expensive cranes to put them in place. And uh, besides the logistics cost of that, um, it actually means that you can't build in a lot of places, places where there's overhead power lines or trees, right? And so our approach, because it's, it's panels, um, and these panels can actually be hand carried, right? They're lightweight enough to be hand carried. Uh, they can be assembled by a crew of, you know, two to four people. And, uh, and, and that's, you know, you know, it really is more like Legos, right? Where they come complete from the factory, right? And all of the, the complexity is done in the factory. And then on site, it's really assembly work, right? And, and what we're moving towards is that anyone who could assemble you know, Ikea furniture could assemble a cover, right? That, that's what we're designing it towards. That's interesting. And I think another aspect where I see, you know, the final aspect from my perspective where I see significant cost savings is that I, I understand the companies that do already take sort of a modular approach don't have quite the precision that you guys have been able to uh, incorporate with a lot of the automation in the factory. And so, um, you know, they, the parts you know, they might be able to build them in the factory, which saves some money. And then they might be able to, uh, you know, ship them in a modular fashion by, by parts, by panels, and, and that saves them some money. But then when it actually gets there, everything doesn't really fit together perfectly. And we're not even talking about maybe customizable um, houses like you guys are building, but even just like something that's fairly standard, something might be a couple inches off. And if the roof doesn't fit on the walls, you need to bring in, you know, skilled labor to go in and fix that, or you need to redo the part or whatever it is. Um, how big of a deal is the precision uh, for you guys versus, you know, some of these other uh, companies that are building prefab homes? Yes. So, so I think you, you hit it, you hit it right on the head right there, right? When we, with conventional construction, because you're building as you go, right? You're putting one piece and then attaching the next piece. And then, you know, you, you're just piecemealing it. You can adjust for imprecision as you go, right? To make the end thing look okay. Uh, the end product. With prefab, like you said, the issue that a lot of these other companies run into is they build these large parts, they build them imprecisely, and then they'll spend months on site patching them together and trying to make it look all right because they're not building precisely. Uh, what we've done is we've, we've, we've engineered our 
building blocks, right? The, these Lego-like panels so that they leave the factory with a level of precision that is it's just unheard of in construction, right? We're talking about, uh, you know, conventional construction might be, you know, quarter of an inch or a half inch, uh, and we're talking thousands of an inch. Uh, and so we deliver these parts and they just, they just fit together. And be because they fit together, that means that you don't have to do all of this extra patching work and, and figuring out how to do the finishes on site. Uh, so we fit, we ship all the panels, including the finishes uh, from the factory. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and uh, again, quite compelling from my perspective. I think, uh, you know, one other thing, I, go ahead. Can I, can I just add to that? Um, the, the reason we're able to do this is because of the team we've built. Uh, our, what we realized was that, yes, we build homes, but we're building homes more like how cars are made. And so our team is, is, is actually folks that know how to build to that level of precision. It's, it's, it's people that have worked at Tesla, people that have worked at Honda and Toyota, uh, and, and then even people that worked at aerospace, right? SpaceX, uh, where they, you know, the precision that a rocket or a car is made at is an order of, is, is, is a couple order of magnitudes more than construction. And so from a, from a team expertise standpoint, they just, they know how to do this, right? And we're eliminating that technical risk. Right. So before we leave the, um, the Tesla analogy, or, or maybe we already have, but I want to circle back for, for one comparison, Tesla, of course, started with the Roadster um, and then sold the Model S and then more recently the Model 3. And they kind of are addressing a larger and larger market uh, with a cheaper or you know less expensive and less expensive car. Um, you guys are starting with fairly, or I understand you started with like fairly expensive uh, additional, it's called an additional dwelling unit. Am I, do I have that right? Yeah, it's a it's accessory dwelling unit, but yes. Yeah, yeah it's fine. So everyone knows what I mean. Uh, it's something you put in the backyard, and you can go, you know, make an office or, or whatever you want to do. Um, so you started with those being fairly expensive, and you guys are based out in LA, uh, so doing most of this locally, or at least you know, last I saw, you doing most of this locally, uh, selling these things, and, and they're not they're not super expensive, but they're also not cheap. It's like a couple hundred thousand dollars, I think for, for some of these on the, on the larger end. Um, but in the future, I imagine you guys have sort of a Tesla like strategy of, uh, you know, getting the, the higher end market to pay for some of your initial products. And then almost like the, like the Tesla model three without really compromising on design, um, you know, still having a beautiful house or, or like Tesla still having a beautiful car, that goes just as fast, the house functions just as well, maybe just as nice accessories or whatever it is. Um, and being able to sell that to a broader market that's not willing to pay quite as much, is that a part of your thinking at how this actually scales from kind of where you are now to where you envision yourself in the future? Yeah, it, it really is. And, and I think the, the one thing that's a huge, that was a huge part of the Tesla strategy was actually overcoming people's fears around electric. And a few years around performance too. And the, the Roadster, you know, by building a high-end car with, with incredible acceleration, they proved that electric could be better than an internal combustion engine from a performance standpoint. And we actually have a similar uh, problem that we're, and a similar approach where today, when people think of prefab, often what goes through their mind is low quality, cheap, you know, mobile homes, right? Like that's what people think. And so a big part of why we're starting off with the high end, low volume market is to actually overcome that fear, just like Tesla did. And so, uh, you know, these homes are uncompromising. I mean, top shelf appliances, top shelf performance, like really high end. And, and then, uh, you know, exactly what you said, as we ramp up in volume, we reinvest into engineering and manufacturing we lower the costs and we make it an even more mass market product. And then we repeat that again and go, you know, to, to the model three equivalents and even more mass, like even beyond that, right. To, to the kinds of homes that you might see uh, out in the Midwest or, you know, uh, built in Texas, which are built at, you know, a lot less than what homes are built at in California, which is where we're starting. Right. And uh, you know, you guys talk about you're providing like an all in one 
solution. Like people don't really have to worry about anything. They just kind of go to your website. And if they meet the qualifications in terms of location, it's off to the races. Can you talk about, uh, you know, I, I'm a bit familiar, but for people listening, I, I want to hear how you describe the process as a whole from, you know, discovering your website to actually having a house. Yeah. So, so the first question that people often have is, well, what, what, what should I build? What can I build in my backyard? Right. And it turns out that that's actually not an easy question to answer because every city has different zoning rules. Every neighborhood has different zoning rules uh, and there are property specific considerations. And so what we've done is we've, you know, the first step is to go on our website, buildcover.com, type in your address. It's right. The first thing you see is is an area type in your address and we'll pull up all of the relevant zoning information. You answer a few questions about, you know, what are you looking to build? How many bedrooms? What's the size? And then we'll show you what the zoning allows you to build in your specific backyard. Uh, and this is taking data that's, you know, in, in hundreds of pages of zoning and geospatial information about your property and, and, and the local uh, neighborhood restrictions and applying that to your property to give you that answer. And so once you understand what you can build, uh, then you can start the design process with us. And so what that involves is that we actually will come out and meet with you uh, at your property in your backyard, uh, of course, socially distanced right now. And we'll meet with you and we'll go over what it is that you're looking to build and ask you 50 to 100 questions uh, that dive into the specifics, you know, things like, how do you want the backyard unit to relate to the primary home in terms of privacy? Do you want to have huge windows? Do you want to have smaller windows? Uh, what kind of appliances do you want in your kitchen? How is your kitchen going to be used? Uh, all of these, you know, how much storage do you need? And so all of the questions that a great architect would ask throughout, you know, a long design process, we've compressed into a, a, a design profile that we create digitally for you. And then we take that information and we take the information about what's possible in your backyard and we combine it to create custom designs tailored to your backyard and tailored to your needs. And so we'll present these designs to you. And this, this is our software plays a huge part in, in generating these designs and telling you and, and, and you know, visualizing them for you in 3D, uh, telling you exactly what they're going to cost, how they're going to perform. So, so it's, it's months and tens of thousands of dollars of design work compressed into days, right? And, and at this point, uh, you can say, okay, I want to move forward with you know this design option and make these changes, and then we can go back and do that. It's it's a panelized system, right? So we've got quite a bit of flexibility. We can we can add space to the rooms, move things around, move windows around so that you can see a tree or or you know block a certain view, and uh, and and so we we arrive at a design that that you know you love, and then that's when you say, okay, I want to sign the contract and I want to build this with you, and so you put down a deposit. And at that point, we, we take care of the permitting process for you. We'll update you regularly on how that's going with the city. Um, that's, that's, the, that's a process that's unfortunately still relatively slow and outside of our control. Uh, but we you know, build these, you know, permit them. Uh, once we receive the permits, we do the foundations. We do the utility hookups, you know, hook up the water, the, the waste, uh, the electricity to, to your primary home. And, uh, and then we, come, we pour the foundation and we come in and we install the cover on top of that. Uh, and, 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 you know, at the end, we'll walk you through it. We'll show you, you know, show you how to use it. And that's it. It's done, right? We're your single point of contact. You don't have to go and talk to, you know, hundreds of contractors or select from a thousand different materials because we've already done that work and found a product that has, you know, great value performs really well and, and it, it's cohesive, right? It's, it's, a, it's a high-end, modern, minimalist kind of feel to the product. And, and, and so you, you don't need to go through all that effort of evaluating appliances and fixtures and finishes and details and you know, working months with an architect. We've done that and we've, we've put it into a system and we can deliver that. Yeah, I've seen uh, videos and images of a bunch of the units and uh, they're, I mean, they're amazing. They're so beautiful. I, I, I have kind of a... Uh, you know, a bias towards minimalist type design. So maybe that's a part of it, but um, they're just to your point. I mean, the details 
are uh i'll get to that in a second i want to ask something else first on permitting because it sounds like that's um you know the innovations that you've brought to the design process in and of itself could possibly be worthy of like a company and like a successful one it sounds like to me uh the fact that you you know eliminate months of work compress it to a few days have some you know a process for taking inputs that are delivered human to human conversation you know it's they don't have to do anything like on their computer which can get frustrating they're just talking to someone and that person plugs it into the system comes out with beautiful designs that are then further adaptable that in and of itself to me sounds like extremely valuable you know ignoring the fact that that's you know only one aspect of of this business the permitting side um well first actually just a clarification what the whole thing what all in like six months or so and uh like i said like a couple hundred thousand dollars or so yeah so, so from, a, from a timeline standpoint uh it, it takes between six and nine months to deliver and that's mostly because we actually have a backlog of orders that we're ramping up production to fulfill okay um well that's you know a good problem to have it sounds like uh the the permitting piece is what i wanted to ask uh just kind of like a sincere question i'm not sure if you've thought about it explicitly, probably have, but, but perhaps not. Um, you know, you talked about how it's kind of like out of your control, right? And I understand it's, you know, it's the government and we see uh, how effective they are on a, on a number of, uh, on a number of aspects these days. But uh, w- when you talk about that being out of your control, is that, you know, is influencing, and I don't know if this is like LA, California, even more local than LA, like within the towns or whatever. I don't, I'm not an expert in this by any means, but um, region to region, town to town, city to city, state to state. Is this something that is impossible for you to influence and potentially change and accelerate uh, their process or something that would just be really, really difficult and you don't, you know, you haven't necessarily tried or been able to do thus far? So what we, we found is that uh, LA City is willing to work with us and, and try new things and, and, and help us make it go faster. Uh, and, and we've done that in cases, right? We, we have been able to move faster uh, where needed. And uh, it really comes down to the city though. That's, I, I can't answer that question, you know, broadly. Uh, it, 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 LA city has been good to work with. Um, you know, it's still, it's still a, a, a government, you know, agency, right? And there's oftentimes, it's not just, you're not dealing with one department. Uh, in order to build one of these backyard homes, you know, or accessory dwelling units, you actually need to be- deal with the fire department. You need to, b- to deal with the building department. Uh, you need to often deal with the Bureau of Engineering when it comes to how you're connecting this to the sewer line. Uh, and so it's different departments. And so a, a big part of the complexity that we take off of your plate is, is doing all of that for you. Um, what tends to happen is that the, if you look at the individual uh, you know, department response times, they're not crazy, right? They're, you know, a couple of weeks often. Uh, it's just that you might need a document from one department to then take to the other department so that they can sign off on their part. And, and that's what, you know, adds up. And so, and so we manage that process very well. Uh, but, uh, you know, there, there's, there's some constraints in, in terms of, you know, how fast I can go. And as, as we ramp up, we're, we're continuing to work with the cities and, and figure out how we can make, make that go faster. Yeah, I feel like you guys would do pretty well in Miami. I spoke with, uh, with the mayor the other day and uh, obviously Founders Fund with, with Keith, you know, back, Founders Fund backs you guys and, and Keith is down there really leading the charge. He's, you know, the mayor is super receptive to working with tech, obviously it could be a, uh, an interesting match. I, I want to talk about the details of the homes for a second. I watched a video and you're, you know, you're showing someone through the home. Uh, I think this was like maybe one of your first units even. And uh, you're talking about how the stove heats the pot, not like the actual surface of the stove. It's, it's the certain appliance that it is. And then you have bamboo and like the, uh, you know, in the bathroom by the sink or whatever. And, and that's like, you know, you chose bamboo because it's extremely durable and it grows like weeds. You've got all these, you, you got the like floor to ceiling windows that go all the way top to bottom. Um, you've got all these like details and, and obviously you're running the company. You, you know, it's not necessarily your job to know all of these things, um, every little detail, but it sounds like you really know you know, all the nooks and crannies of all of these units. 
how important to you was it to be, I think you used the word earlier, uh, you know, really uncompromising on quality and, and details? Yeah, it, it, it is really important. And the reason for that is it's, it's two things. The first one is that this is our, our equivalent of the Roadster, right? Low volume, high, high end. And so what we're doing is we're proving to the world that we're better than conventional construction, much better than conventional construction. And whenever you're trying to move someone towards taking something new and right, a new approach to something, there's always an inherent uh, fear, right? And so the solution that you have can't just be, you know, 10% better, 20% better. It has to be 10 times better, right? Um, to overcome that friction of, of an inertia of just the norm, right? And so a, a little bit better isn't enough. And that, that's why we're, we are obsessive around the details uh, because that's what makes our homes, you know, feel and operate like multi-million dollar, you know, the top architect, uh, you know, and better than those homes, right? Uh, if, if you were trying to build a cover with, you know, using con or a, a, a unit that looked and felt like a cover using conventional construction methods, you'd probably spend at least three months, if not like up to a year, uh, going back and forth between, you know, a team of very expensive architects, like top architects, right? Best in the city, uh, best engineers, uh, and, and, you know, like the number one general contractor in your neighborhood uh, to, to go back and forth on how to do this, right? And so if you tried to you know, replicate this, it would be, it'd be very, very difficult uh, with conventional construction. Uh, and so, you know, what we're doing is we're, the reason it's so important and we are so obsessive about these details is we need to prove to the world that prefab is not a compromise. It's, it's better than conventional construction. And then from there, we can make it, you know, lower cost, and, and, and abundantly available as we ramp up production and, and invest into manufacturing and, and engineering. Right, so we've been talking a lot about how you guys like Tesla, um, like other companies, uh, Peloton maybe being one, um, you've got this uh, vertically integrated solution where you're in control of every step of the process from, uh, you know, plugging in their, their zip code or their location to the design process, the manufacturing, the on-site. There's nothing really throughout the process that is not under your guys' pur purview and responsibility directly down to, you know, every screw and nail in the house and every detail of, you know, the bamboo and everything like that. Um, separately from that, I saw you had uh, a, an interesting tweet, which I'm going to read. It was, you said, uh, Construction is a bigger opportunity than automotive. It's more fragmented and even less dollars go into R&D. So that's, you know, that's one tweet. And I'm going to read another one because uh, Founders Fund, your guys backer, I know Delian works closely with Keith. I don't know if you guys have interacted with Keith directly, but yeah, we've his, yeah. Yeah, yeah, his pinned tweet on his, on his Twitter, I don't know if you're familiar, but it's, uh, you know, formula for startup success. Find large, highly fragmented industry with low NPS, net promoter score, uh, and vertically integrate a solution to simplify the value product. So I think about that and like, I don't know if you... Oh, had, you what, I when, love, love that. Like, as soon as I saw that, I, I, I knew that Keith and I would get along. Yeah, it's like, it's basically the thesis for what you guys are doing. Yeah. Uh, and you know, there's a reason I read the tweet because you talk directly about um, the fragmentation and then everything we've discussed so far has kind of revolved around this aspect of you guys controlling every step of the process, the vertically integrated business. And it's just, you know, because of the fragmentation in the housing industry and all of these different people you need to bring together and all of the friction and unnecessary time and energy and expense and reduction in quality that goes through as a result of that process, you have, I mean, I don't know like what, what the net promoter score is technically, but I imagine, you know, next to the DMV, getting your house built or getting like a repair on your house is probably like one of the most complained about things. It, it may be worse than the DMV. Let's put it that way. It may be worse. You say? Yeah. That's pretty funny. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very, uh, you know, I, I, I don't usually get like this on uh, with, with every entrepreneur and I've had a lot of entrepreneurs on the show that I think are uh, 
you know, super successful, you know, to name one, like Delian, who came on your guys, investors starting a space company. Um, I think his company, I'm also really excited about. They're obviously just getting started, but that seems huge to me. Um, this yep. is like kind of an out there question actually, and, and a little bit off topic, but, um, he's obviously doing manufacturing and, or, you know, planning to do manufacturing in space. Is there any, have you guys had a conversation if there's any sensibility to doing anything related to housing in terms of the manufacturing in space? I know it's not nearly, you know, anywhere near the top of the list of things that make sense to manufacture in space, like, uh, you know, 3d printing hearts and, and things like that. And, you know, uh, silicone and, and everything like that. But, is there, was, has, there, has there been any conversation about that? There's been a little bit. And, and the, the conversation has basically been, well, when we start, you know, colonizing other plant planets, uh, it's not going to be two by four construction and hammers and nails. That's for sure. So we're going to need alternatives to how we build homes. And, uh, and, and, and you know, we want to be the company that's going to do that. You know, after we take care of the problem here on Earth and make housing abundant and low cost and, you know, raise the bar. Yeah, I, I like how you say uh, when we colonize other planets, not if. Um, that's that's pretty cool. So um, I know you know we talked a lot about these ADUs. Are you guys building independent houses now as well? Uh, right now, we're focused on these these backyard homes, these ADUs. Uh, and uh, although we have built one, which is a full two bedroom, two bathroom, it's out in Joshua Tree. Uh, there's there's a dwell article on it, and you can actually rent it on Airbnb. Uh, we built one, and that that's a that's a that's a standalone home. Uh, it would, you know, to prove that this works well, uh, you know, in both a more extreme climate and also, uh, you know, a full home. So there was more of a, of a proof of concept, but today we are not delivering uh, other than backyard homes. And the reason for that is we're starting small. We're focused on iterating quickly and keeping the iteration cycles short. Uh, and we can learn a lot more by building, you know, five, 500 square foot homes than one 2,500 square foot home. Right. And that's why we're starting off with these backyard units. Is there an aspect, though, of connecting like plumbing and electricity that is concerning at all for making that jump? Or it's just a matter of time, similar to like what we said with Tesla, like you're, you know, you're spending a lot of time on these super high end ADUs. And when the time comes and you've got some, you know, cost efficiencies, you can go ahead and you kind of have a, a pretty, you know, n- not a high degree of risk in your plan to kind of move towards the independent homes. Yeah, there, there's no real technical risk uh, in the jump from backyard homes to primary homes. I mean, we've we already built one, right? And it, and it works great. Great. So last question for you. Uh, I know we're coming up on time. Um, when are you, I, I understand at least that these are mostly, if not all in or around LA right now. When are you guys, you know, building and shipping and, you know, uh, installing these covers elsewhere? Because uh, you know, I'll be, I'll be first on your list to, to get one, assuming I, uh, I can get a piece of land somewhere and make it work. So the approach that we've taken is to focus on delivering a really incredible end to end experience in one place, um, especially because there is a regulatory specific component of this, figuring out how to streamline that process in one place and then expand rapidly to many other geographies. Um, that's the approach that we've taken. We're still in the process of, you know, improving that end-to-end experience and process here in LA. Uh, and then once that's done, we're going ex- to expand beyond it. It's not a, a timeline that I can publicly share. Okay. Yeah, totally understand. Um, well, again, it's, uh, it's really exciting what you guys are building and uh, looking forward to seeing what the future holds for cover. Um, any last words that you have, you know, feel free to share. Otherwise, we'd just love to know, uh, you know, where people can go to, to learn more about all this and, and to follow you and your company and, and see the progress as it comes to fruition. So if, if you'd like to follow our progress and, and see what we build, uh, you can do so on, on our Twitter or Instagram. Both of them are cover built. Yeah, uh, I think the, the only thing, th- thank you, Jake, for, for having me. And I think the only th- other thing to add is that uh, this is a hard technical problem and we're, we're hiring for many roles, uh, software engineers, uh, you know, so- software is a, we, we haven't talked about it a lot. We've mentioned it briefly, but it's, it is a huge part of what enables this to happen because it's, it's a mass customization problem. And the, the part that you know, manages that customization and makes the customization scalable is all software. Uh, and so we're, we're, you know, actively recruiting for software engineers, mechanical engineers, manufacturing engineers, and all sorts of different, you know, both production roles, 
um, engineering roles and, and also business roles. So, you know, if, if you're out there and listening to this uh, and interested in, you know, literally building the future, uh, please reach out. Oh,